So you, uh, you will recall, by way of uh, summing up, um, that St. Paul had a special relationship with the Philippians. Generally speaking, he did not take gifts, or which is to say money, uh, from the other churches because there was, there's always strings attached. Even when you say there are no strings attached, there's always strings attached. And especially in the Roman system, which was um, built on, on patronage. Patronage is an official kind of Roman term, and it means that your rich, influential, powerful patron, um, you go to him and he will help you if you need a job or if you're in trouble, he will bail you out or he will do something on turn. You are you um, praise him a lot. You, you, you essentially you suck up to him and things like that. So the the Roman Empire was was system built on uh, honor and shame. So you give him lots of honor and stuff like this. So you have a patron client relationship. Um, and so part of the Saint Paul's reluctance to accept money from any any of the churches is that he didn't want to give the erroneous impression that he was somehow beholden to them, that they were the patron and he was the client. He said, no, actually, I'm the father, you're the, you're the children. It's, it's, it's actually the other way. So he said, well, I will support myself, thank you very much. I will make my money and pay my own bills through um, my trade of um, making tents, things like that. But w with the Philippians, it was, it was different. He was willing to take uh, gifts from them on two or three occasions, which, which testify to the very special and close relationship which he had with the Philippians. So the Church of Philippi, as we mentioned before, also, also summing up, began with persecution. It began with St. Paul being arrested by the people in Philippi who had a great sense of their being a Roman colonia. They were a colony. They were a little bit of Rome uh, um, uh, dropped in Macedonia in, in the north. Um, and so uh, they, they knew that he was, um, you know, they knew that uh, St. Paul was a Jew and giving some sort of a Jewish thing, Jewish Messiah, something like this. And so there was a riot there as the, as the people said, these men are advocating customs which it is not permitted for us to accept being Romans. So he had them, uh, had them thrown in the slammer illegally. Um, and then finally, when they were released, um, uh, they, they left. But of course, the, the Philippian church began with this sort of persecution of Paul, and then they learned that Paul is on trial for his life in Rome, might be executed as a um, traitor to the Roman Empire, as a dangerous, subversive individual, which has direct implications for them in Philippi. So they were scared, they were afraid. They do what most people do when they're scared and afraid, which is to say they begin to quarrel. Um, and they, they had sent Paul a gift, um, uh, yet another gift of, of money, uh, at through, at, through the hands of one of their number, Epaphroditus, with the understanding that he would, they would make sure that Paul got the money and he would stay with Paul to see him through what was going to happen, hopefully his release, uh, and then come back and report. Epaphroditus got, got quite ill and St. Paul said, you, you, you better go home, your family's gonna think that you're dead because uh, you can't just phone him up and say, mom and dad, I'm okay. No, so this was a, so Paul was sending him back, but even though Paul was on trial for his own life, he had concern for the honor and feelings of Epaphroditus. So there were a number of things that he's doing in this very short epistle. One, he's saying, uh, don't be afraid. And he's saying, uh, don't quarrel. Um, th and honor Epaphroditus. He's not, he's not bailing on me. He's not letting me down. He's not uh, disappointing you. He's not shaming you. Um, he, he's, he's doing what, he's, what he is supposed to do. Um, and, uh, and to try to uh, deal, with, deal with all of these things and to thank them for the gift of money. So uh, we had, saw how the, in the epistle began with the normal greetings, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the uh, church officers who, who had uh, arranged for the gift, the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Then there was the normal Thanksgiving, with which all of those ep epistles began, and the normal prayer for them, with which all uh, ancient epistles began. Then he dealt with um, uh, the fact that they're scared, and he said, "Don't." Then they're scared not only for themselves, but mostly for him. He thinks he's he's going to get condemned. He's going to die, and so he tries to put it in some sort of perspective and says, "Look, all that's happened to me, it, that's it's good news. It's not bad news. It's it's good news. It it's, happens for the." advancement of the gospel. Because he was, of course, under uh, under house arrest. You mustn't think of him in, in some sort of a slimy dungeon. He was under house arrest and he was chained to a guard. There was a, a guard in Rome called the Praetorian Guard. There was thousands of people. Uh, they, they could be scattered throughout the Roman Empire or they could be 
billeted, uh, 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 as it were, in Rome. Uh, ended up being eventually the, the emperor's like personal bodyguard. So, and they would be chained to him. So you'd have this little chain, you'd be chained to one of the guards, and then he finishes his shift, and goes home, and you're chained to another guard. And then he finishes his shift, and you're chained to another guard. So that Paul gets to share the gospel with everyone of the Praetorian Guard, one by one. He's saying, so, what are you in here for? Have you heard of Jesus of Nazareth? <laughs> Where's he going in him? He's talking about a captive audience. So who's the captive there? You, know? you can't leave and get away from Paul because you're chained to him. So he says, so because of this, the whole Praetorian Guard has heard the message of the gospel one at a time. And so that's good, that's good news. So he's trying to put their, their hearts to rest in verses 1 to 26. And now in uh, Philippians 1, 27, he, tr he tries to exhort them to unity because they were quarreling a little bit. Um, and you can also see that the ancient church was a family. The temptation, of course, today is to think of the church as primarily a place where you go to have church services and possibly to hear long sermons. And then you smile and get out of there. You know, may or not be a coffee hour, but you. But if you have a, if you have your coffee, you have a coffee. You smile at people. You don't know them. You don't want to know them. You're just there for the services, and then you go home. Whereas, it was it was different in here. They were primarily a family together. That's why they were quarreling, because they shared each other's lives. And if you're going to be, I would suggest a real healthy Orthodox parish, you need as much as you can to be a family. Admittedly, it's easier to be a family if you all live in this small little town. If you're all in Philippi, you could probably walk to each other's house. If you're the lower mainland, not so much. So it's, it's a little hard uh, here at St. Herman's. Geography has, has always been our enemy and our foe because we're trying to become a community when you're spread out uh, from uh, North Vancouver, West Vancouver, uh, to Chilliwack. You can't walk from one place to the other easily. Driving is a bit of a pain too, but nonetheless, that's 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 the goal. And it, because that they were a family, uh, that uh, some of the people would quarrel one with another and to leap ahead um, um, uh, a little bit. Saint Paul has to um, ask a couple of the women to uh, uh, cut it out and stop quarreling. Chapter four, verse two: I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony. Let, literally to be of the same mind in the Lord. Oh, indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. You get the impression that whoever the uh, um, true companion was, <clears throat> it was a fairly thankless task. My guess is that it was the brother of one and the wife of, uh, the wife of the other, but that's a guess. But the point is these two women did not get along. And so St. Paul says, guys, guys, you gotta get along in the Lord. You know? so, so this is all of the um, the fact that they were quarreling uh, actually re reveals that they were quarreling because they were a family. If you go into a, if you go into a church and your, your church consists of going to the services, never getting to know anybody else, you're not going to quarrel because you don't care enough about the other person to actually uh, know them to, to quarrel. So, so they were uh, quarreling because they were because they were scared. And so in in one one twenty seven. Um, just read a, a little bit and therefore and take it a bit at a time. Please feel free to jump in with um, <coughs> objections, questions, whatever, whatever it seems good to you. So he had said, convinced of all of this, backing up a little bit in verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for, the, for your progress in joy in the faith so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only... Conduct yourselves, verse 27, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, literally one soul, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by, by opponents, which is the sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. I'm going to back up a little bit and get you into the Greek because the, uh, it's a whole different thing in the Greek. So um, he says whether, so the, the only, monon in, in the Greek, he says, look, whatever happens there, this is the one thing I want. This is the one thing. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And the word conduct is not the usually word for conduct or behave yourself. That's the word peripateo, meaning to walk. 
you know, when you kind of walk through life, your journey. No, this is the word um, uh, poly to am I, and it's to essentially conduct yourself as a citizen. Later on, St. Paul would talk about our citizenship. Um, oh, where is it now? I don't have my reading glasses on, so this is always interesting. Um, uh, our uh, chapter three, verse twenty. Our polituma, our citizenship, is in heaven, from which we also wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, a polituma, that's your citizenship. If you were a Philippian, your polituma was was Rome. This is this is this is the verb. So, uh, a Philippian would conduct himself, mindful of his citizenship, as a Roman. And so, Saint Paul is saying, you got to conduct yourself. Your citizenship. Uh, is different. Yours is not in Rome. Yours is heaven. Philippi was supposed to be a little bit of Rome in the middle of, in the midst of Macedonia. Um, if you want to know what what Rome is like, go to Philippi and you see guys wandering around in togas and speaking Latin and with stuff like that. Um, and and in the same way, our citizenship, our polytuma, is in heaven. So if you want to know what heaven's like, look at the church. That's the theory. How, how well we have lived up to that is, uh, is another, another matter entirely. But that's the point of, of saying, conduct yourselves. That's, that, that's the word, poly to am I. Remember that you are citizens of heaven, uh, not, not citizens down here. You don't belong here. So because of that, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Uh, the word worthy is the word axios, of course. So when a person is, is ordained, the, uh, originally, before he was ordained, the people would give their vote and say, would say, Axios, he's worthy. Let the ordination proceed. Now we do it afterwards, so it functions as like a muzzle tov. <laughs> if, like, if, if the guy's not worthy, it's a little late. He's already ordained. <laughs> we should maybe fix that. But, uh, but, but that's the idea of, of, um, of worthy. You are worthy of the status that you are, are called to. And so St. Paul says, that's you. You uh, Conduct yourselves as citizens in a manner axios, worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent. You see how, again, you see how delicate he is. So he says, whether come and see you or remain absent. Come and see you because he's alive, absent because he's dead. So, but he didn't want to say, whether I live or die, because he doesn't want to get them all nervous again. So he says, so whether I come and see you or whether I remain absent. That's, that's you know, the sensitivity of the, of the apostle. He's mindful that the kids are nervous. So whether I, um, whether I come and see you or I'm in absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, literally one soul, or one, one personality, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Um, the word standing firm is the word um, steiko in the, in the Greek, and it means, you know, like if you're plant, okay, is this recorded? So if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're planting yourself firmly, that's like stick home. You're not just kind of standing here. No, no, you're, you're planting yourself. Nothing, nothing's gonna dislodge you. That's the word, stand, so not, not just standing, but standing firm, immovable, because he's aware that there's persecution happening and lots of things that would move them from their stability. He says, no, no, that's why I use the word stick home. Hang in there, be stable. Don't, don't, get, don't get pushed around by, by fear. So they have one spirit, which is to say one motivation, one mind, one soul, literally. Psuche is the Greek. Uh, so that they're, they're one family. They're all thinking the same thing. They're all on the same page, as we would say. We all have the same goal. We're all uh, pushing in the same direction. And, we, and the word used, interesting, is a striving together. Soon atleo. Uh, atleo <coughs> from, it is from the word from which we get the word athletics. So... Um, and, this, and, and, and the soon is the co-part. So we're all athletes running the same race, uh, fighting the same boxing match, to use another Pauline, Pauline metaphor. You know, we're, we're, so what's striving together doesn't, it's too, uh, it's too flaky a word. You're athletes together, you're, you're sweating, you're, you're grunting, you're, you're working, you're, you're, that sort of stuff. You know, so, so when, they, when you see someone running an, uh, an Olympic race, you know, when you, so that we're, that's, that's the sort of athleto thing that, that we got. It's not, it's not just, yeah, we're all trying. No, no, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's, it, it presupposes more strength and uh, uh, ferocity of determination together. And once again, it's not just athleto, soon athleto. We're all doing it together. So he's trying to stress the unity <coughs> that we have. 
Um, and he says, and if you're, if you're, that's what you're doing. You're, you have, you have unity, and you are no, in no way, alarmed by opponents, which is this, this translates it a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and th and, that, and that too, that, that that salvation from God. The word sign is, is not the usual word, Greek word for sign, semion. It's the word um, uh, endixis, literally a demonstration, a proof. So if I were if I were going to demonstrate, I don't know if I um, if I added this chemical to that chemical, it would turn green and blow up or something like that. You know, then mm -hmm. how you demonstrate that, how you prove that, is to get, get the two chemicals, add them together, and watch it blow up in front of you. Mm -hmm. So that's a demonstration. That's a proof. That's what he's talking about. The fact that they are that they're being persecuted uh, and experiencing pressure from the outside, and yet they're maintaining their unity and they're calm, they're serene. They're not trembling, they're not shaken, they're not um, you know, crying out for mercy or trying to say, well, it's, we're not as bad as you think, no, that sort of stuff. You know, he said, this is a sign that God is among you and that therefore this is the proof, if anyone's looking, that they will be saved in the last day and the enemies who oppose Christ will be destroyed in the last day. That's the proof. It's sometimes translated sign, sometimes translated omen. Omen sounds, yeah. You know, like omens, like watching the, the flight of birds or something like this. That's an omen. That, that's, that, that's not what it is. This is the, the normal word for proof or, dem, or, uh, or demonstration. So, so if, they, if they can maintain their unity of spirit and, and, and um, serenity of heart, you know, then this is a sign, this is a, 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 a proclamation of the gospel that these, these are not normal people. These are people that belong to heaven. They, they, they do not belong for the earth. Um, and then, then he says, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And the word is granted is the word, uh, the word karizomai. Um, uh, has granted, well, given to you as a gift. The word karis is the word for gift or for grace. You know, if you get, if you get a, Big present that you don't deserve, that's grace. That's a gift. That's a charis. The word uh, charisma means a gift. And so we're charismatic. The charismata, or the, are the spiritual gifts. So this is a kind of like a, a verb form of it. Charizomai means to be given as a tremendous gift that you don't deserve. And he says, the gift that you have been given that, uh, that you don't deserve because of the glory that, that we're good, that you're giving it to a, not for your sake, but for, but for Christ's sake. This will glorify him. And the gift is to, is to, is to believe in him and to suffer for him. Mm -hmm. So inst instead of saying, oh, I'm suffering for him, oh, shoot, rats, <laughs> That's, what a bummer. No, this is, this, is, this is a tremendous privilege. This is how you earn your glory in the age to come. Like the old Sunday school thing says, no, no cross, no crown, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so this is how you, uh, this is how you earn uh, the praise of Christ, this is how you earn the glory that's, that's there. And, and so he says, you're, so you're, when you, if, now that you're, the suffering is coming upon you, you're now experiencing the same conflict, this translates, that you saw in me, you saw how he's being persecuted, and now you're hearing it, that I'm still being persecuted, you're experiencing the same thing too. And the word conflict is the word agon, which in which English word agony, actually. Uh, and agon is a fight, is a wrestling match. Um, uh, um, uh, agonizomai is to, is, to, is, to, is to wrestle, is to fight. It's, to, it's a, an athletic term, a, an Olympic term. You know, conflict is kind of like, it's a, it's a bad word. You know, ooh, we don't like conflict. Okay, well, this, well, okay, well that, that's, not, that's not this. This is the wrestling match. This is the boxing match. This is the, you know, so, um, and so, and so, and so Paul says, this is what, this is a gift from God for you. Uh, stop, stop there in chapter one, because Paul continues to, to, to go on. Any, are there any, any questions about anything before I zoom ahead through? I'm curious about all the um, metaphors surrounding athleticism and yeah. Olympics. Was that, do you think, um, just so relevant for the culture? I mean, it's a, it is such a fantastic portrayal of what. Yep, yep, he was, yep, see, Paul was talking about. Um, uh, um, take, uh, taking the thing that was a part of, of, their, of their culture, like, mm -hmm. like uh, 
the games. The, 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 in honor of the gods, people would have athletic games and stuff like that. And there would be a, uh, readings, of, readings of poetry, the new play written by the Greek playwright or something like that. And so, um, so St. Paul uses a lot of these um, uh, athletic, athletic metaphors. So for example, in 1 Corinthians 9, um, uh, he says, um, this is in 1 first, first Corinthians 9, 24, do you not know that all who run in a race, um, uh, um, all run, but only, only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. For everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, the, the laurel crowns, but we an, an imperishable. Therefore, I myself run in such a way, not as without aim. I box in such a way, not as beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I, I will not be disqualified. So, oh, thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so you, you get these um, um, constant kind of metaphors because they know they know what that's about. They know it's a um, uh, it's an honorable thing. That's what people admired. They would, uh, especially in the gladiatorial games, the, the world's forbidden to the, to the Christians because they would have that. But they would have these uh, slaves who would who would fight as, as gladiators. And they're called gladiators because the the sword was called a gladius. That you can stick the person with. So, um, so they would have um, just just like you have I don't know fans of wrestlers or boxers or I suppose baseball players a little. Um, they would have th a, the gladiators would have their own particular fans, and you you can make a pile of dough and great fame, assuming that you didn't get killed. Um, but they would but they would throw them in there fighting with other other slaves. Um, um, or they would fight with the wild beasts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Rome did it because they thought we want to show that we are strong, we're not afraid of death, we don't care about bloodshed, you know, especially yours, that sort of thing. So it was the, um, so it was a Rome was an empire built on on violence actually, mm -hmm. and so this was the kind of the, but it was uh, uh, these were the people who would who would fight as gladiators or who would fight as boxers, which you didn't kill yourself, or running in the Olympic games or they had the Pan-Isthmian Games, I think centered in Corinth, but they were, wasn't just the Olympic Games, there were a, a number of these Greek games. Um, they were, uh, the people who competed in them uh, had all sorts of uh, praise and attraction. It was, it was, it was thought to be a, a wonderful and honorable thing. And so St. Paul says, okay, that, that's, what's, that's what the Christian life is. Mm -hmm. Christian life is not just, you know, kind of, I, I, I've said this in his prayer, now I hang around and don't play cards while I'm waiting for the rapture or something like that, so whatever the normal thing is. No, it, it's, it's, it's a, it, it's, it's struggle, it's boxing, it's running, it's, you know, the, the, the emphasis is on, uh, and St. Paul says, again, I discipline my body, make it my slave, or li literally, I, I enslave it, so that after I preach to others, I may not be disqualified. He, he didn't take it for granted that uh, he could, that, you know, it was still possible for him to fall away Probably, probably wouldn't. But, but he said, "But uh, it's a, it's it's a constant. Uh, I have to be vigilant about that." In the letter to the Hebrews, it says, "We need to pay closer attention, basically that you need to pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest you drift away from it." So it, it's a, uh, it's taken for granted that being saved is a is a state, but it's also a process. Mm -hmm. You kind of it, it is it is a it is a state from which one can drift away, hence the the sense of. You know, disciplining yourself and running, running the race. I mean, hence all of those ath athletic mm -hmm. um, things. So, anyway, from uh, the Corinthians, I'm in the wrong epistle. You mentioned the suffering being a gift, and Paul mm -hmm. talking about the suffering being yep. a gift from God. And then the verse that you just wrote, read right there. I've heard that being referenced as like kind of a key text in pointing towards the path of asceticism yeah and like both of those both, like how would you um this there's that's a very good point so that the um what when say paul's talking about suffering basically he's talking about suffering persecution um uh he's he's not talking about i'm wearing a hair shirt i'm I walk with a pebble in my shoe to hurt myself at all times. That's always the closest thing. The idea of inflicting pain on yourself 
is largely absent. Um, in fact, in, in, in Colossians, hang on, I'm going to have to bring my reading glasses. This is just, where am I now? Uh, he's, he's talking about um, uh, early form of Gnosticism, actually. Um, hang on. Well, it's a long sentence, but it says, uh, essentially, let no one defraud you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement. The worship of angels, taking a stand of visions he has seen inflated without cause and in the city's fleshly mind, but not holding to the head uh, from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and, and ligaments grows with the growth that is with God. Drop down a little bit. These things have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, um, to paraphrase him a little bit, uh, the, the idea of saying, well, if I if I, if I walk with a pebble in my shoe, or if I hurt myself, you know, I mean, there was a, um, there was a, what is it called now? In some forms of Western asceticism, they have a little hand thing with some, uh, a whip flagellum. with a, yeah, sorry? It was called a flagellum, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, and they yeah. whack, you know, whack or something yeah. in the back of it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, this is, this, this is not a great ad for the Christian faith, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and, and St. Paul says, and it doesn't actually do anything. Because the, the problem isn't the body, the, the problem is the heart. It, it, so fleshly indulgence doesn't, doesn't come from the desires. It's, that's, the, that's the trigger, but the heart is the main thing. So when St. Paul says in Galatians, those that belong to Christ Jesus with its, uh, um, have put the, uh, find it for you. Um, it's actually worth quoting in its entirety. Uh, he says, uh, this is in Galatians 5. He's talking about this, um, the works of the flesh are plain and obvious, and the fruit of the Spirit uh, is there. Um, and he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the, and then he says, significantly, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Um, so they, the, um, the, there's, there's suffering attached to putting the, to, uh, uh, crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires, but you don't do that through getting a whip and whacking your back. That will probably not do anything except, you know, wreck your skin. Um, he 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 doesn't he does he goes on to say, if we have been given life by the Spirit, let us also literally uh, walk walk straight by the Spirit. It's it's by the Spirit that you put to death the deeds of the body. He says so. Um, uh, or he says, for example, if you back up a few verses to verse 16, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the, of the flesh. So he, he didn't say, well, whack your back with a whip, and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. If you, in Romans, another passage, he says, you put to death the deeds of the body by the power of, of the Spirit. So uh, so you can do all of these things, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, and, and if it, if, I guess the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If you, if you do it and it does help you, but most of the time it's not going to, I would suggest it. Uh, extreme acts of asceticism, you know, not, don't, don't necessarily get you where they want to go. If they do, good. I mean, and I'm, and I'm starting to get above, above my pay grade because a monk would say, you ever tried it? Admittedly, no, I've not prayed on a rock for a thousand days. And that probably ain't going to happen anytime soon. So, so Seraphim of Surab might say, so you don't know what you're talking about. Maybe a little bit, that's true. <laughs> but I do know what Paul's talking about. So, so, the, um, so all, all this is to say that the, this, the suffering that St. Paul says, uh, is, it, that's the gift that you embrace, is to, is to, is, is to suffer for the faith. Um, it's not a matter of you know uh, whacking your back with a flagellum or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so and if the and significantly the church has said, look, if the if the world persecutes you, rock and roll, but don't go don't go out of your way to to find it. Um, the um, there is a there was a canon that says, look, if if there if this if the state is clamping down on the Christians, don't walk into the police uh, station and say, hi, I'm a Christian, and give them the middle finger. What are you gonna do about it? Yeah, don't, don't do that. So 
and he said that if they persecute you, it, you, it is permitted to you to flee persecution on the basis that, that the Lord said in, I think in Matthew 10, if they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. You know, you, but, if, but if they catch you and bring you back and they say, you have to deny Jesus Christ or we're gonna kill you, that's when you gotta say, well, that ain't gonna happen. So, you know, um, St. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage in two, I wanna say 50, 256, anyway, Mid, middle of the third century. Um, they kind of arrested him. First, he did, he did take off. He thought, well, if I get martyred, my church is left without a bishop, so I'm going to my cottage, essentially, or his ancient equivalent. Um, but they did eventually grab him, and, and when they, uh, and they, of course, they, said, they asked the famous question, are you a Christian? And if you said no, you have to prove it by saying today by cursing Christ. Um, but if you said, yeah, I'm a Christian, he says, okay, well, that's, um, that's, that's, a, that's um, an admission of guilt. Uh, and so he um, uh, admitted that he was a Christian and they pronounced sentence. Uh, Cyprian has been um, condemned to be executed by the sword. And he said only two words in the Latin, thanks be to God, mm -hmm. you know? So, Deo grazia, so, because he was a Latin guy. So, I mean, so if, if they catch you and they say, we're gonna kill you, you say, thanks be to God. It's been granted to me not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you could, if you could, if you could hightail it out of there, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't, you don't court the suffering. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. anyway, I I remember if I could share with you one little, uh, I've shared it with some of you before, but not everybody shared it possibly. Um, there was the this the story's been told of someone who was uh, fighting for righteousness. He was in. He was in South Africa, and he was fighting against um, the apartheid that was there. And I don't think they were doing weird things, to him, confiscating his passport. I mean, they were persecuting him in a big way. And someone asked him, he said, look, why don't you just get out of South Africa? You don't have to, just get out of there, just give it up. You know what, mm -hmm. forget it. Why are you making it so hard on yourself? And he, and he explained his actions by this. He's saying, you know, if I, if I, eventually I will have to stand before Christ and give an account of my life. And when I stand before him, he will say, show me your wounds and I'll heal them. And if I was to say, I don't have any wounds, I got out of South Africa, the Lord would say, how can that be? Was there nothing worth fighting for? And he said, I couldn't, I couldn't stand here if I say that. I'm staying in Africa and fighting. So, okay, so that's what, so he, he could say to him, it has been granted for, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him in, in, this, in, this, in this particular way because he wasn't fighting against apartheid because he was, you know, whatever. He was doing it as a Christian to say this is, this is ungodly and not right. And since that's where I am, I have to speak the truth. And if I get, if I get, if I get into trouble for it, rock and roll. And so, so anyway, chapter, chapter two, if that's, all, that's okay. Um, it begins with the word therefore. And remember, um, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my love, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on, uh, intent on one purpose. Um, I remember uh, uh, Donna was saying that when she was a Baptist, they had this little kind of Baptist thing, and it said, whenever you see uh, uh, a thus or a wherefore, Always ask to see what it's there for. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Sure, but but this is the but the but the, the wherefore or the therefore is actually it's 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 the, it's the Greek word un little tiny word, but it, it's a, it's significant because it connects what he's saying with what he just said because of what I just said. Therefore, you got to behave in this way. Um, so so the and what he so what he was saying is that. Um, you are, because uh, your suffering will, will, and your unity in the face of suffering will reveal to all the world that you are, have been saved by Christ, you're in the world. Because of that, therefore, have that, have that unity. Um, and Paul being Paul, he, 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 he piles the words on very, uh, one on top of another. So if there's, th if there's this, if there's that, if there's this, if there's that. So, so if he says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, and the in Christ means in your church experience. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you get the word in Christ, en Christo in the Greek, the, the temptation is to say, oh, it's one of those religious things. What does it mean? I don't know, it's a, it's a religious thing. 
No, it's, it, it's, it's an experiential thing. To be in Christ, and Christo means to be in the church. When St. Paul says you are in Christ, he means you are part of the fellowship of the church. When they gather together, you're gathering with them. That's what it means to be in Christo. It doesn't mean, I've had this experience, and now I'm in Christ. Yeah, the experience is baptism, and it puts you into the church, the body of Christ. So when he, there was, if there's any encouragement in Christ, what he means is that if in your life together as a church family, you find any encouragement, that's, what, that's the in Christ part. And the encouragement is the word um, a, a periclesis. It sometimes means encouragement, uh, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes, sometimes means consolation. So it means that if you're, if when you come together and you pray together and have the Eucharist together and eat together and, and share, share each, each other's lives, if there's any consolation in that, if there's any encouragement, if there's anything that kind of binds you together and say, yes, you know, that that's the word encouragement. It's 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 the word encouragement is such a vanilla word, you know, but it means good. consolation, something that when you're when you're too tired to go on anymore, you you find you find the new strength, new strength to new strength to do it. You know, um, if I if you'll forgive a quote from um, the series Firefly, which I always use, um, one of the one of the say the, the the series Firefly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay, so yeah. So okay. So anyway, uh, uh, sadly, uh, uh, a victim of uh, network stupidity. Died after one season. Anyway, so one of the one of the sayings in Firefly was that this this guy was saying, you know, when you can't walk, you crawl, uh, and when you uh, and when you uh, can't crawl, you find someone to carry you. Okay, that's what essentially that's what that's what that's what Paul's saying is we carry each other. If we, we we walk together, we run together. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl. If you can't crawl, there is. Uh, there is perichalasis in Christ. There's consolation. You can find somebody to carry you. That's what it's talking about. It says, "Most is saying, I'm very encouraged." No, no, it, it, it's it's more of a group thing that we encourage and console and strengthen and carry and carry um, carry one another. And Saint Paul says in another place, um, "Carry one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." That's what it's that's what it's talking about. So if someone says. Um, uh, uh, I'm having a difficult time, I'm depressed, I'm blah, blah, blah. In, instead of just saying, oh, that's too bad. What's on television? No, no, you, you somehow, as St. Paul says to the Corinthians, when one member suffers, all suffer. When, when one member is honored, all rejoice. It's in 1 Corinthians 12. So that's what it's talking about. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, the word fellowship is the word kononia. And I think it talked about what kononia means, that you share something. If I had a sip from this, which I have, if I passed it around, my germs that was standing, and you all had a sip, we would have the kononia of the water. We'd be sharing or having a communion in the water, as it were, like that sort of stuff. And so, so, what, he, so what he's saying is that there, um, if our experience of the, of the Spirit binds us together in any way, so that we're not... Uh, isolated, atomized individuals. You know, I'm over here, and you're over there, and you're over there, and we don't have anything to do with each other. No, the, this is the, mm -hmm. the, the the Holy Spirit binds us into one body. That's what St. Paul means in Ephesians, where he says there's one spirit and one body. <coughs> so the, the one spirit animates each individual Christian and binds them together in one body. So because of that, we have unity one with another. Um, so he says, so if there's any uh, encouragement that comes from being in Christ, if there's any consolation of the fact that you love each other, if there's any binding together, this koinonia that comes from the, from the Holy Spirit, if there's any, this translates it, affection and compassion. Um, the word affection is or the word splachna, as I mentioned before. Splachna, it means essentially your guts. I think it's badly translated in the King James as bowels. Technically, anatomically, that's correct. Your, your bowels are your splachna. But it's, 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 a, it's a metaphorical word, not a medical word. It was understood that the emotions come from your kidneys, actually. When you're looking at the, um, in, the, in the Psalter, God is the one who tries the heart and the reins. The reins means, is the word meaning kidneys, as in renal. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, so it was understood that the heart is the, the it's not you know I love you so much you know that's not that's the that's the kidneys again um, <laughs> the, the the heart is the the organ of choice I you know I I choose this I don't choose that I have my heart set on this that's my choice not my heart set on that um, so to forgive your brother from the heart means that's what you choose to do it has nothing to do with you know uh, I, I I forgive my brother and I feel wonderfully uh, warm and fuzzy about it. That's the kidneys again. The heart is heart is the choice. The kidneys are the emotions. So when it says in the Psalm that God God tries the hearts and the reins, he means your choices and your emotions that go along with it. Um, so uh, this Hebrew thing comes into the Greek as splachna. So that it's so when it, so you're saying if there's if there's any emotion that you have for one another, if you actually care about each other. So that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're grieved by the other, other person's mis, mis, misfortune. Um, uh, if, if there's any, like uh, tirmos translates it com compassions, and it's in the plural. So com when you translate compassion, you, you miss it a little bit there, um, because it's it's in the plural. It means that there's any acts of compassion, not com not compassion in general. You know, I have compassion for you. Sure, why not? Whatever that means. You know, no, it means that if, if you've if you've experienced people having a person has had compassion on you and put his arm around you and fed you when you're hungry or something like that, if you've had these experiences of compassion in the body of Christ, so St. Paul's appealing to all of this. If there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation that comes from loving each other, if there's any binding together, fellowship, koinonia comes from uh, shared uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. If there's any splachna or acts of octirmos, okay, and, and presumably there is, you know, <laughs> uh, hopefully in abundance. But but he's um, he's not saying well, it's probably not. But you never know. No, no, he's saying this is guys. I know you. This is your experience. And so because it's your experience, in verse two, um, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love, united in united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Um, uh, make my joy complete. Uh, literally, fulfill my joy. Plerao is the Greek. So it, the, uh, right now, God, Paul's got a little bit of joy, but his joy would be overflowing and complete. Um, and again, try to remember that this is a guy in prison on his life who's saying, you know, if you will just. Um, uh, uh, you, you can, if you if you exp if you express your unity, if you express your love for one another, I will be completely, absolutely joyful. Even the fact that I'm in the slammer on trial for my life, couldn't be happier. So, okay then. Um, but what you got to do is be of the same mind. Freneo is the word too. So, freneo is the have the same attitude. Uh, Frenema is a mindset, an attitude, an approach. Freneo is the verb. So you have the same, the same agenda. You're on the same page. You want the same thing. You have the, you have the, you have the, have the same goal. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit. Um, sum, uh, sum suchos. Suchos is the, is the word for soul or your, your personality. And the, the, the sum is the same thing. So th this is an attempt in, in, in English to say you're, you're same souled. You've got the, mm -hmm. uh, it was, um, there was an old, I, I, who said it? Some, is it a Greek or a Roman? It was talking about friendship as um, the same soul in two bodies. You know, we're 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 soulmates is the way that we'd probably say it now. So that's that's the sort of thing that it's saying. I want you guys to be soulmates, not in the sense of you know you're my soulmate. No, that you know, that's sort of not the cheesy stuff, but uh, but that's the sort of unity that they would have. Um, uh, intent on intent on one purpose. And so what does that look like? Well, in verse 3, he tells you what it looks like. He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty, empty conceit. Um, uh, eretia is, is, a, uh, is a word for selfishness, and it means kind of, I'm, I'm determined to get ahead, and if I have to walk over you to do it, that's fine with me. That's kind of what it means. So, I mean, selfishness, again, it's, it's one of those vanilla words that it's, it doesn't capture capture what St. Paul's actually saying. He says, 
the idea that says, I'm in it for what I can get out of it, and, and I wish you well, but who cares about you? you know, that's, that, that's, he said, no, do not, do all the actions that you do, let it not come from eretia or a kenodoxia, the, the, the keno is the empty part, the doxia is, is glory. In other words, so what it, this empty conceit, well, what, what, it, what he's trying to say is you, you do stuff so that people can praise you. See what a spectacularly wonderful person I am. You know, I want you to, I want you to think well of me and praise me. Oh, you're such a wonderful guy. Look at that. that you know, it, and it's called empty, uh, empty glory because it's it, it's valueless. Mm -hmm. It's the opinions of men. Like who cares? You know. So, um, remember there was a, I think was it Chrysostom. So I, I think it was Chrysostom who said someplace that if you knew how quickly they would forget you when you're dead, you. <laughs> You would not mm -hmm. worry about all of the praise of man, you know. Because as soon as you're, as soon as you're, as soon as you're dead, boom, there, you know, you don't. That's it for you. So, it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're praised, because it'll. So what matters is, you, as Saint Paul says in Romans, you're, if you're a true Jew, your praise comes from God, not from men. He says, I want you guys to be true Jews, and, uh, you know, true, uh, truly pleasing God, not just worried about what people are going to say. But with, with humility of mind, um, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So when he says you're more important, uh, regard each other as more important than yourselves, that, that's, that, that doesn't mean, you know, after you. No, after you. No, after you. No, after you. You know, you're more important than me. No, you're more important than me. No, you're more important than me. That, that's not that. That's just stupid, you know? Um, so, but and, and that's not what Paul's talking about. Say so Paul is talking about if there's a, if there's a, um, a task that needs doing, don't think that it's beneath you. You know, it's when it, when it, so others are more important than yourselves. They say, no, it's okay, I got it. You know, I suppose so, because especially in in the Roman world, uh, you are really conscious of your social standing really conscious it was roman society was very heavily stratified so you had patrons and the clients you had um, um for example you would you would if you were a slave you would you would greet the client by you you greet your, your patron by making up making a prostration um if you were uh, a client you would uh, kiss the person's uh, hand if you were a little bit more you might kiss the person's shoulder if you were the equals you would, you would exchange the kiss of peace but it was you were really careful about. You wouldn't do something that was that showed that you have, were lower than you actually were. Yeah. So the idea of um, a very important person saying, "Oh, I'll do the vacuuming," no, because people see you doing the vacuuming and you lose honor. The one thing that you don't want to lose. So, so you, you're really careful about your status, you know. And 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 Saint Paul says essentially that's garbage. You know, esteem the other as more important than you. If you see the if you see the floor needs vacuuming, vacuum the floor. Um, so that's a sort of kind of practical stuff that it is. It's 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 not a matter of saying, oh, I'm nothing, I'm a worm. You know, you you can have this. Um, false humility. Uh, I'm sorry. False humility. False humility, and so there's a certain there's a strain in orthodoxy that 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 has that there. Um, so when you can find some some people, clergy or monks are the worst for it. Uh, they will sign themselves, you know, sinful Lawrence, you know, or unworthy Lawrence, that sort of stuff. I thought to myself, well, that's true, but you don't sign yourself that, you know. <laughs> but, you know what kind of a, you know idiotic Lawrence? Look, the wife knows that, but you, but you don't you, you don't need to advertise it. You know what I mean? And so so the when the, when the clergy will receive holy communion, what they say is. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the precious and holy body of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ is given to me, unworthy Archpriest Lawrence, for mission of sins and life everlasting, amen. But I don't sign that in my letters. I just say, yours always follow Lawrence. You know? I don't say, the sinful worm, Lawrence, <laughs> because nobody, nobody believes that. You know, most people don't believe it when they say, I am unworthy. Well, I, I can say that to God, because I know that I'm unworthy because I'm talking to God. But when... It's, it's a form of saying, see how humble I am? I'm just the unworthy worm, unworthy to pick up, you know, that sort of stuff. And, and you, you realize, it's a crock, okay? You know it's a crock, I know it's a crock. It's, it's you just stop, you know? So there was one bishop I know, he always he would sign the antimons 
uh, that, that cloth that you have to serve the divine letter John. Uh, let's say that his name is George. It wasn't, you know, humble George. I thought, yeah, nobody who's humble really says that. You know, it's kind I of ironic. Humble words. Yeah, you know, by that, you know, it's like saying, I am the infinitely modest Lawrence. <laughs> okay. By definition, well, now you're not, because you just said that. You know? yeah. Nobody who's modest makes a point of telling you how modest they are. Nobody who's humble makes a point of saying that they're humble. And, you know, and so, so it, it is, in my view, um, an affectation. Uh, and it's, and, and admittedly, the people aren't doing it to, the, the, I think mostly they're not thinking. This is part of the, the so semi-monastic culture, mm. you know? So, I mean, but I mean, if, if all the monks are saying, I'm humble and you're humble, then it kind of cancels each other out, you know what I mean? So, you know, um, otherwise you get into saying, I'm actually more humble than you are. You know, kind of like, well, by definition, you can't be when you, you just said that, that, that sort of stuff. So anyway, that's not what Paul's doing. It, it's, it's possible to read Paul's exhortation to humility that he's about to give um, as a way of saying, you know, I'm so humble, humble, humble. I have poor self-esteem. I think that I'm just, I think of myself as just, less of the dirt beneath your feet, you know? That's, there's a certain amount of, I would suggest, psychological pathology in that. Um, first of all, it's unreal. And, and if you really do believe that, you should probably see a therapist because this is not, this is not, this is not healthy. Um, the really humble, as C.S. Lewis said, my first Lewis quote of the evening, is that um, uh, the, the really humble person isn't thinking about how terrible they are. They're, they're, they're thinking about you talking about you and I'm interested in, you know, what do you think about this? And so, or possibly your attention's on Christ, but it's, it's not on yourself and how horrible I am. I'm just a worm. I'm less than, the, less than everybody. I'm the most sinful person in the whole wide world. Because you're not, you're not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about the other person. You're thinking about Christ. You're thinking about what do I need to do? Oh, I can vacuum the floor or, or whatever. So, so that's not, uh, that's a million miles away from, from what Paul's actually doing. Because so he's about, so that that's what he means when he says, um, regard one another as more important than yourselves in this, in this <coughs> human culture. Uh, do not uh, look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. The word look out is the word scopeo, literally scope out. Uh, uh, scopeo means just simply to see, but it means not just to say, oh, I see you. No, it means to, you know, I'm looking at you. Um, that's <coughs> like mic microscope, you can see little tiny things. You know, telescope, you can see things that are uh, distant ways, you know. Um, so, so, they, um, so when he talks about looking out for your own personal interests, he means looking for opportunities to serve the other person, you know. So if you see somebody with a, a bunch of, I don't know what, um, uh, heavy, heavy parcels struggling to open a door, you scope that out, you can say, oh, I can get the door. A, a small little thing, but that's, that's the sort of thing, you're looking for opportunities to serve scoping them out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so because this is spectacularly countercultural in the, in the Roman in, in the Roman culture, um, he says, you know, because they would say, yeah, who does that? Glad you asked. In verse, in verse 5, we find out who does that. Uh, so, I'll, I'll stop for a second. Any, any, um, any, any questions or comments before I leap into verse 5, possibly one of the most famous Christological bits of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. we're, we're okay? Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is the so-called Christ hymn. The uh, opinion is divided as to whether St. Paul is quoting an already existing hymn, or, as I think, that he's just writing. I don't think that he... And the, the, some people would... If it's, if it's a hymn, they, they, they say, how many so-called strophes are there? How many lines are there? And the fact that they disagree with how many strophes there are mm -hmm. tells me that it, it, they might be reading uh, hymnic structure into it and not reading it out of it. Because, you know, I mean, if you said, um, um, I don't know, a limerick, there once was a man from Racine, da 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 you, you know exactly how many, uh, mm -hmm. how many lines there are to the thing. If you're not quite sure, then, then maybe it's not there. Maybe, maybe you're reading into it. But anyway, just uh, there are admittedly different, uh, different, different opinions about it. Um, very often if Paul is quoting something, you know, he, will, he will say, as it says, but, but anyway. But it is one of the um, important Christological bits that are there. So 
He says, have this attitude among yourselves. This is in yourselves, but it means um, uh, among yourselves, um, which was also in Christ Jesus. The attitude is the word frameo that he uses a lot. It's again, your, your mindset, your attitude, your approach. This is how you walk through life. And so the example, when, so, when someone says, who does this? Jesus Christ did that. So, so he is our example, uh, a fairly countercultural example, because everybody else said, my honor is the most important thing, and if I lose it, I lose everything. And Christ had the honor and gave it away. So, so have this attitude among yourselves um, uh, when you're living together as a community, which, which you have an example in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being in the, made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is about every name, so, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the hymn. And so you can see the, the downward and the upward. Christ humbled himself and therefore exalted. It's mm -hmm. kind of what his, his mom, the Most Holy Mother of God said, you know, uh, he, uh, read the thing, it's in the Magnificat. Um, He's exalted those of the Lord with him. That's the one. Um, which is also based on um, the Song of Hannah in First, uh, first, first Samuel two, but you have the. Uh, um, it's actually worth um, worth quoting a little bit. And Mary said, "My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for He has regarded the humble estate of His of His slave. For behold, from this time all generations will count me blessed, for for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is from is upon generation after generation towards those who fear Him." He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered the proud who are in the, in, the, in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who are of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he has set empty away. So you get the idea that that's what God does. If you're one, a proud dude on your throne, God will rip you down from there. And, but if you're, if you're the humble, God will exalt you. So that's, that's, that, uh, that's God's MO, as it were. That's, just, that's, just, that's, how he, that's, that's how he rolls, so I may say it res respectfully. And so if you, if you uh, the, the Lord said it or in, in the Gospels, he humbles himself will be exalted and he who exalts himself will be humbled. So the, the Pharisee uh, who has came into the temple and said, I'm so wonderful, God, don't you, aren't you just mightily impressed? Because he was exalting himself, God humbled him. And this man went, went down, not justified or forgiven. But the, the tax collector, because he humbled himself, because he said, all he could say was, God be merciful to be the sinner. Because he humbled himself, God exalted him. So the Lord said, because this person, the, the, it was a tax collector who went down to his house justified and not the other guy. He said, why? Because one who humbles himself, like, like the tax collector, will be exalted. The one who exalts himself, like the Pharisee, will be humbled. That's what happens all the time. Said, and it's happening in Christ as well. Because Christ humbled himself through the incarnation and the death of the cross. Therefore, it says um, uh, 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 in verse 9, dia, God, God, highly, God highly exalted him. So I'm going to unpack this a little bit because it gives you the whole Christological uh, package. Um, prior to his birth at Bethlehem, he existed in the morphe of God, in, in the form of in the form of God. The, the form of God is that's uh, that's how you roll. That's how you that's your, that's your place. So he was in the form of God, but he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Um, uh, um, our pe our pegmos is the word. It's to it's to grasp not it could be in the, in, the, in the sense of snatching what doesn't belong to you or it could be the sense of holding on to it you know I've got to so if somebody was trying to physically um, haul me out of here when I didn't want to go I would grasp the table and you know, and not kind of uh, be, be be hauled away 
and so I, and I suspect that's what's actually that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, although he was in the form of God, he did not regard the equality with the Father a thing to be held on to, but rather emptied himself. Cannot always oh, is the Greek word. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the King James, I think, says, made himself of no reputation. Okay, but the, but the word is cannot oh, It's to, to empty yourself. All the glory that he had, all the privilege that he had, all the adoration that he had from, from the angels, emptied himself. He said, mm -hmm. gone. So, mm -hmm. and made him, and took on the morphe of a doulos. So he's in the form of God, in, uh, with the, and now he's, now he's in the form of a, a, a doulos. This translates a bond servant because they don't like the word slave. Um, but, but that's what it was. So a slave has no rights. You, 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 you couldn't get a starker contrast. God worshipped by everybody, and a slave has, which is essentially a, a, a human tool, which had no rights whatsoever. Mm -hmm quite the switch because he was born in the likeness of men anthropos meaning a human being and the, the likeness doesn't mean well, he looked like a man but he wasn't a man no no it meant that <clears throat> he was <clears throat> he was completely like us in every respect not sin admittedly but you know he had the same temptations we do he, we experienced the same fear the same hunger the same thirst <clears throat> all of that sort of thing he was exactly like us later on they, the theologians would say 100% God and 100% man in the, in the one Christ. So, and so it found in the appearance, schema, as a man, he humbled himself further by becoming obedient to death, even, th this says death on the cross, what the, what the Greek actually says is the death of, of the, the cross. The most shameful, uh, yeah, humiliating, horrifying deaths imaginable. It was, it was significant that it was considered by the Romans. You didn't talk about crucifixion in polite company. It was, what they would do is that they would, they would, first of all, if they were condemning you, um, it, it, it was called the slave's death uh, because you couldn't, you couldn't crucify a Roman citizen. You could behead him, but you couldn't crucify him. So what they would do is they would uh, take a, a scourge, which was a, a, a baton with little leather straps on it and with a little bit of a bone or metal at the, at, at the end of it, and they would scourge you with that. Uh, it's, it was essentially lay your back open. So down to the bones, down to the, the burn, the, the nerves, like a, a number of people died under scourging, depending upon how hardy you are. And so they would, they would, they would scourge you, then they would have the so-called um, so patibulum, the, the, the cross piece, and you would carry it on your back to the, the place of crucifixion, lay it down, they would be the vertical place. They would nail you, nail you to the cross and or tie you. And the hands would probably go into here. They're, they're guessing a little bit, but the, the word hand, here in the Greek, means essentially a forearm. So to, to go through the hands, it's through here. Um, probably because if you put it through here, it just tear the thing up. So, but through here, uh, the feet, not quite sure whether they, whether they went in I'm not going to put my foot up on the table, but whether it, the side or whether it went into here or whether they crossed them, not, not, not quite sure. But they would have be, and then you would be left there uh, to die. And it could take days. Uh, flies would buzz around you. You'd be dying of thirst. So um, uh, cold at night, during the heat of the day, flies would start to eat you uh, while you're still alive. That's uh, because there's lots of blood in the back that it, it attracts flies. So, um, and so this was... Uh, not a good way to die, and they did it in as public a way as possible. That's why they would crucify them on um, right outside the city where anyone could see, or possibly at the crossroads. And the message that the Romans made by that is, don't mess with Rome. You mess with us, you're next. And so they, it, most people got the point. Um, so it was, it was significant that there were no, in, in artwork, there were basically no public... Uh, uh, portrayals of the cross until after Constantine abolished the thing, mm -hmm. uh, abolished a, a crucifixion as, as a form of, of public execution because it, it was considered to be too gross. Yes. I also heard that it was extremely difficult for people to breathe. I'm sorry? When, when they're hung up on the cross, it was yeah. really, really hard to breathe. Yes, they're, 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 they're thinking that what happened was um, it was hard to breathe so that if you wanted to uh, they, you'd, you'd be sitting on probably a little um, stump thing, little pole, and they would be, uh, from, from what we can figure out, um, 
because there are no there are no descriptions of it, so we got to guess a little bit, you know. Um, there was a little a footrest, uh, so that and it wasn't they weren't being nice; they were prolonging the agony. Yeah. So that if you want to draw a breath, you got to push up with air to draw the next breath. So that if they wanted to kill you, they break your legs, which is why that when they wanted to finish them off, you break their legs. So you ain't pushing up anymore, and you asphyxiate fairly quickly. So, so. The, and, but they were they were they were no rush to they were no rush to polish them off. They said, "Oh, the, the longer the better." Mm -hmm. So, they, so that was um, uh, they, they polished off the thieves fairly quickly because, the, as as John said, the coming Sabbath was a high Sabbath, and they they didn't want them on the cross on the Sabbath because mm -hmm. they got it. So, but so that's why they broke their legs. But they came to the Lord; he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. But that's why that's that's the point of the legs. Like, why I could break the legs, kill them. Well, if you need your legs to breathe. So, so everybody knew that it was a horrifying, terrible way. Um, and they, uh, it, it, there's not smoking in polite company. They do not portray it. And so when you have, you know, crosses, that was not. So when, so you can imagine when, when the Christians said, God came down to become a human being. First of all, that freaks out anybody. They would say, uh-huh, no, that's just... <laughs> You know, there was a captain of a chaplain of Celsus, a Roman um, opponent of ours, um, and he said, if 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 he was a god, shouldn't he have a voice like this? And he speaks and then it echoes this thing like this. He just he talks like a normal guy. That's that's not that, that's not a god, you know. And the idea was so. Let me get this straight. Your god came down and became a human being like us, like with all of the indignities that come from with you with you know. Uh, human life and nature, and, and he died on a cross. He was a criminal. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's pretty sick, don't you think? It was. I mean, it was considered to be. I mean, we kind of take it for granted while we're in crosses and stuff. But it was. It, it, it was considered to be outrageous. Sick. You know, it's, it's kind of like that, that's not funny. Mm -hmm. you know, it was. It was. It was, it was a, you're just sick and wrong. So uh, there was a. The, there was one um, famous uh, um, graffiti thing that they found. Where'd they find it? Well, let, 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 let's say Rome. But there was a guy, I think his name was Alexemenos, maybe Alexander. And so there was a picture of a guy on a cross with, with the head of a donkey. And there's a picture of Alexemenos and it's next to the cross. And this guy wrote, Alexemenos worships his God. You know, as a way of you know, saying Alexemenos is stupid. You know. So it, it, it was considered to be you know, too sick to be funny. So that, I, we, I mean, we tend to think of, you know, the sign of the cross, and for us, the, mm -hmm. the, the cross is um, mm -hmm. uh, we, an instrument, you know, we, we kiss the cross. Mm -hmm. I mean, for them, it's, it's like um, if, if Christ had died in a little electric chair, it's just like kissing the electric chair. Mm -hmm. You know, it was considered to be, you're kissing the cross. Like, what's wrong? You, yeah, you know, wrong with you. Yeah, yeah like, that, that, you, you guys are sick, yeah. sick. So, so that's what, I mean, so th this is why it's so scandalous mm -hmm. when we, we were considered to be, you know, you know, of course they're practicing incest. Uh, of course they're practicing cannibalism. You know, people who would s imagine that their God comes down and dies on a cross. Clearly, it's something wrong with these people. So, okay then. So, but that's what he's saying. So he, the God, the God be, be, be emptied himself, came to, so the one who was uh, worshipped by the, the cherubim and the seraphim and all the company of heaven comes down and becomes a human being and humbles himself further, not just to death, but to the death of the cross. So you, you can't get further humiliation. That's as far as, the, that's, that's the, the limit of descent. You can't get any higher and you can't get any lower. So, so um, in, verse, in verse nine, for this reason, Dio is the word, because he hum because he because he humbled himself, therefore God highly exalted him, and bestowed karizomai. It's the um, uh, it's the I'm looking for the Greek here. Just a sec. I want to say it's the same. Yeah, it is. It's the same word used in two has been granted for Christ's sake to suffer. Give it as a gift. It's mm -hmm. the it's the same word. Um, uh, it bestowed on him or gifted on him the name or as we would say the rank which is above every name so at the name of Jesus every knee will bow both those in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. Um, the, uh, conceptually and imaginatively, they had like a three-tier universe. Heaven, <coughs> earth, the underworld. Okay, so this is not exactly uh, um, scientifically, but that ain't the point. The point isn't, you know, you know, Paul, there's nothing under the earth. It's just like lava. Yeah, that, that ain't the point. He's, he's talking about the heavens above or everybody on earth or the dead in the underworld. You know, so the, you know, the saints, us guys, the, the dead guys, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, an image of uh, completion and universality. Every single person who ever lives, living or dead, um, uh, will bow at the name at the name of Jesus, which is to say, acknowledge His Lordship. So the the um, the quote, every knee will bow. It's in it's in capital letters in this, which is to say, they are referring me back to Isaiah forty five twenty three. So Paul has as an embedded quote, and in Isaiah forty five, Isaiah forty five. Um, uh, 23, God is talking uh, to, um, to Israel and is saying, uh, well, it's so wonderful, you, hey, you just back up a, a little bit. God says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and it will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear. They will say of me, only at Yahweh are righteousness and strength. Then will come to him, all who are angry at him will be put to shame. And in Yahweh, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. So that's the passage. And significantly, Paul is taking, to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. He's applying what Yahweh said about himself, he's applying it to Jesus. So, I mean, again, you gotta figure out, you wanna, you wanna a proof that Paul believed in the, in the deity of Christ. Well, for one thing, he said he existed in the form of God, just for starters. But even after that, he, he consistently, throughout the New Testament, takes the verses that, that are about Yahweh and applies them to Jesus. So if you're a Jew, you don't do that. You know, It's like you take all the verses that talk about God and apply them to Rabbi Akiba or something like that. You know, you know, no. Inconceivable to a Jew. But not to Paul the Jew, because Paul knew Jesus was the everlasting son of the everlasting father. So the, the things that, that apply to Yahweh apply to Jesus as well. So that it is to, uh, is to, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. And what they will confess, whether they like it or not, is that Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The term Jesus Christ is of course not a, um, not a name, you know, like uh, John Smith or something like that. So it was a, it's a uh, Jesus the Messiah, or the Messiah Jesus. Christos means, of course, Messiah, uh, the anointed one. So he's saying that Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Yeshua ben Yosef, to give him his legal name, is Mashiach. He is Christos. He is, he is the Christ. All of the, the hope of Israel, for Israel's destiny and glory, find their fulfillment in, in Yeshua, in Jesus. So Jesus Christ is, it's, it's not like son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. No, no, Je <laughs> Yeshua is the Messiah. And, and more, more significantly, right to writing in, in, in Philippi, everyone acknowledges that heaven and earth or under the earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The word Lord is the word kurios, and it was a title of, given to the Roman emperor. The, the Roman emperor thought, I am the kurios. Thank you very much. It, it was a, um, the word kurios can be, it, it, it can be simply, you know, sir, excuse me, sir, can I help, can I, well, you know, or it can be used for your lord, like the master has, has uh, the, the slave has his master, the slave has his kurios, um, or it can be absolute master. Mm. So that when they wanted to uh, translate, what, what, when the Jews were reading from the Old Testament after a certain period of time, when they would come up against the name Yahweh, they thought the name Yahweh was too sacred to say. Mm. So they wouldn't say Yahweh, they would say Adonai which means in Hebrew, Lord. So when they came to translate it into the Septuagint, they translated it kurios, which is the Greek word for Lord. Um, so it's, it, so it, it's, a, it, it's an elastic word. And that's why Caesar said, yeah, I'm the kurios, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so for Paul to say, Jesus Christ is Lord, he is saying that Caesar, the emperor, is not the kurios. Jesus is the true emperor of heaven and earth. I mean, you, you can't imagine, it's, it's, it's considered to be treasonous. 
You can't say that Caesar is not the kurios. Paul said, yeah. All Christians say, that is the confession. He said, no, that, that it, if it is by the Holy Spirit that you say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is kurios. It was a, 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 a political claim. It was a scandalous political claim. And the point is, it was known by everybody. When you say, Jesus Christ is Lord, you are dethroning Caesar and saying the world is not run by Caesar. Caesar is not the master of the world. Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified Jew, is the master of the world. And he is running the entire world from the right hand of God. I mean, so you can, the, the, the Roman reaction can be, can be imagined, hence the persecution. And it, was, it doesn't stop with Jesus. It's, it's, all of this is, is to the glory of God the Father. Because all of this was the, was the plan of the Father. So the Father and the Son are kind of not rivals, as it were. Mm -hmm. so, so when he's, he's giving you this uh, uh, encapsulation of the Christian dogma, the incarnation, the, the Christ is, is the absolute top, comes to the absolute bottom, and because he emptied himself uh, through this act of divine humility, this act of divine condescension, therefore God highly exalted him. So what Paul is saying is that this is the example that you have in Christ Jesus. You should serve one another. You should not worry about your honor because Jesus didn't worry about his honor. And so if you humble yourselves, if you also empty yourself, consider others as more important than you, God will also exalt you. That's the unstated, uh, that's the unstated thing. So why should, I, why should I do this when I'm such an important person? <laughs> that's why you should do that. <laughs> Especially if you're an important person. And by the way, you're probably not as important as you think. But uh, there's something in it. So um, maybe stop there because he goes on in another sure. that section there. But, uh, and then he, uh, any questions about anything? I'm, I'm determined to stop at, at, at eight, no later. Mm -hmm. So that, because I could just go on, but uh, that would be. Seems there's, a, there's an interesting sort of relationship between humility and heroic attempts of, like, you know, you're talking about asceticism, for example, and stuff like this, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's curious because humility could be quite simple, doing simple things for yeah. you know, other people and so yeah. on. But then at the same time, you know, there's something really heroic about this descent of yeah. Jesus as you know, yeah. God basically into this extremely humble position. Yeah. So it, it's kind of hard to wrap one's yeah. head around that. Well, it, and it's the, the it, it's, you, you, you can do it more simply, but you gotta get, you, go, you, you almost have to, in, in, especially in, in those days, you have to have an interior revolution because everything in that culture said, you know, I'm not vacuuming the floor because I have slaves, that's their job. You know, and you know, I have people for that. And so you need an, the interior revolution to say, you know, forget it, I'm not gonna worry about my honor. Then it's, then it's simple. But if you don't, if you haven't got this interior revolution, if you're, always, if you're always worried about, you know, my dignity, mm -hmm. then, then it kind of hurts to, you know, lower yourself. Uh, but, but, you know, but, say, but once, you, once you get it, then it's no big deal. Because I, 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 I've already parted with my dignity. The, I mean, there was a, um, uh, there was a, uh, was it now? I think it was in the Gregorian Sacramentary. Don't quote me. But it was from there, it found its way into the Anglican Prayer Book. And it talked about God, the phrase, his service is perfect freedom. What it means is slavery to him is the perfect freedom. If you're, uh, the Lord said, you know, the one that commits sin is a slave of sin. You're a slave to your passions, you're a slave to the feelings of, oh my, my dignity, you know? But, th and that's a, that's a form of slavery. But if you say, forget it, I'm gonna do whatever God wants me to do to please him, then that's your freedom. I, I'm set free from concerning about, you know, uh, my precious dignity. What are what are people What are people going to think? You know, as long as it's the right thing, as long as it's it's, it's, it's what pleases God, you're a free man. But uh, otherwise, you're enslaved to the praise of to the praise of man. But there was a story about um, um, some monk, which one it was. Um, he, he, a person came to him and said, "You know, I, how can I?" I, I want to be humble, Father. How can I, how can I do that? And he says, tell, tell you what, go to the graveyard and uh, find some dead guy in there and curse him. T just curse him out. Just tell him, call him every name in the book. So the guy goes in there and says, you sure? Yeah, okay. So goes in there, 
goes to the dinner guy, curses him, and you know, uh, you know, you're miserable, blah blah blah. I won't, you know, so, and so, and then he comes back and says, uh, uh, and I, "Did you do?" It? He said, "Yep, I cursed him up, down, swore at him, and stuff like this." He says, "Okay, now go back to the same guy and praise him. Tell him how wonderful he is. Nobody like him." Okie dokie. So he goes back to the, to the graveyard, same grave, praises the guy to the skies. And so then, he, then he comes back and he said, so when you were cursing the guy, what reaction did you get? He said, nothing. He didn't say anything and didn't uh, de defend himself? No, he said, okay. When you, when you praised him, what reaction did you get? He said, nothing. Like, like he didn't care. He says, good, be like that. He said, don't worry about whether or not they curse you or whether or not they praise you. As long as you're saying, you know, if someone thinks, someone thinks badly of me because they, they, he, he misunderstands me, you know, then that's the, uh, that, that's, the, that's, that's the problem, that's the slavery. Remember there was one um, song, dating myself, I forget, I forget that, there was one, but anyway, one, one of the lines of it said, you know, oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. I forget who's singing it. I, you know, they, they're, they're, does it ring a bell with anybody? I, I can't. Yeah. Oh, I can't think of it. I'll think of it at three in the morning. I won't phone you. But it was the, <laughs> it was the oh Lord, please don't, let, please don't let me be misunderstood. And I thought, well, how pathetic is that? How, how misunderstood was the Lord? You know, how much, how, how much, how misunderstood were all of the Christians? You know, please don't let me be misunderstood because they might not like me. I thought it was a, you know, so the, the you know, you got to be like the corpse. He says, you can, you can curse me all you like and I, and I, and I don't care. Or you, or you can say, oh, Father Lawrence, you're so wonderful because you're God knows what, you know? It doesn't matter. If I, my, like, like again, like St. Paul said in, in, in Romans, our praise comes from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you think of me is, is of less concern than if a God thinks of me. So if I'm doing the right thing and you're cursing me, that's fine. If you're praising me, I don't care because you're probably a bit of a jerk anyway. So as I, who cares, you know? And and like, like I said, ten minutes after I'm dead, I'll be forgotten. You know, so the, so um, so we gotta. But that's the I, I would suggest that's the humility. But you, but you gotta like this monk said, you gotta have the inner inner revolution. You've got to be you gotta determine for yourself the the blame and praise of the world is, is essentially valueless. But it's it's what Jesus thinks of me that. That 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 is that is value and absolutely, and absolutely nothing else. Oh. Anyway, I have a quick question, if I may. Yes, it's please. A large topic, so maybe you can just let me know if I'm on the right direction or sure. not. Um, just in verse eight, where he says he being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Yeah. There's a lot made of uh, Christ's obedience and the death I'm think in his death I'm thinking here I'm thinking in Gethsemane where he's praying yeah. beforehand he asks the Lord if there's any other way but yeah. he's obedient and so I'm taking that I've been trying to understand that for years and then taking the whole corpus of St. Irenaeus's work on re recapitulation and the yeah. undoing of Adam's yeah. and yeah. Yeah. twisting of humanity I, am I on, perhaps on the right track that his Christ's obedience is in some way reversing the effect of Adam's disobedience as... Um, yeah, in, in the sense that there was... Um, uh, the, the Lord, because it was the trailblazer, um, that this is, he shows what obedience looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, he shows what humility looks like. He shows what love looks like. He shows all that, all that, all, all that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that St. Irenaeus said, um, uh, he was he was talking about uh, Eve and and, and Mary, mm -hmm. and he said the the knot that the virgin Eve tied by her disobedience, mm -hmm. the was loosed by the virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. So you had the the two virgins Eve and Mary yeah. by her disobedience, um, uh, she tied us up in knots, mm -hmm. and then by her obedience to the to the to, to God, Lord. Um, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That loosed the knot. Mm -hmm. And but, but but as you said, we, the the recapitulation isn't in Mary. The the, the recapitulation is 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 in Christ. He's the one that that uh, lived the perfect life, so that when we're in Him, well, because our salvation consists of incorporation, not just you know a verdict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 a verdict. But mostly a mostly a verdict because we're incorporated in Him, yeah. and so we're incorporated in the one who. 
who, if, if, if we follow him, then we're following, then we're, we're following the right way. Yeah. This is just like one example when it comes to humility, but it'd be good. Yeah. I mean, he, he could have said, I need you to be heroic because Christ was heroic in the garden yeah. or something like that. You, know? so you could almost say that our, the, the, the rehead of the new human race, which was the new Adam, which was yeah. Christ, yeah. rather than the old Adam, as our head was in disobedience, yeah. our new head as the new creation, yeah. as the new human race is in yeah. obedience. Yeah, that's right. And there was one, I think it was a Puritan. I'm not, I'm not up on my Puritans, and I don't want to be up on my Puritans. But it was said that um, Adam and Christ had, um, each had uh, all men kind of dangling from their belts. So in Adam, all of the disobedience are kind of dangling from his belt. You're like Adam. Uh, if you're in Christ, you're, you're kind of hanging from Christ's belt, as it were. Mm -hmm. So that's what St. Paul means in 1 Corinthians 15, but he says, you know, uh, Christ is the last Adam. Mm -hmm. The first Adam messed it up, the last mm -hmm. Adam got it right. Sort mm -hmm. of thing, so. Yeah. Bless your heart.